Segoli Nario Liwas, Skanagoga, Skanago, Laguerio Ni Yuyaks. And I just said in Oneida, greetings, what is the news? Are you with peace? I am with peace. My name is He is a Good Man in Oneida. This here is my dog, Mildred, little Millie, and it is a beautiful day to be with you all. Grateful for each and every one of you. I honestly have to say it's such an honor to be in the group me with you all, to be, be able to learn from you all from the weekly discussions. You all have been truly phenomenal. It's been really an honor to learn from each and every one of you. So as we go into our talking circle this week, as we put our minds together, so be it in our minds, as we say in Oneida, from my eagle feather box here for my good uncle Leonard. Um, also to acknowledge life, my great uncle, um, who recently just passed away as well here this week. So I want to, uh, my great uncle Ben. Um, so as we acknowledge and lift up his life, uh, as he um, taught me, like Uncle Ben in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. So grateful for my Uncle Ben as well. So that being said, grateful for each and every one of you here. Let's get into the weekly discussion as we have a number of things to get into this week as we're using our eagle feather. It's a liaison between us and the spirit world. You, yes, you are a human being who is worthy of love. And I hope you've been taking care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. This week for your group, for your group me talking circle, you'll be spending about five to seven minutes or more outside meditating with nature, giving thanks and paying respect to nature as you, as you would with a relative. So I got a lot in store for you all. I had a lot in my heart last night. I had a dream, had a vision I was, and it's all about pouring into you all even more. So just about that they're just, uh, just to invest in you all. So, so we put our minds together. So be it in our minds. I'm grateful for each and every one of you. I do believe there's a reason that each and every one of us are here together. I had a mentor, Professor Georgiana Sanchez, still with us, who's a member of the Shumash Nation here in California, and would talk about if you feel like, am I supposed to be here? And she would say, of course you are, because you're here. And I'd say, am I supposed to be who I am? And she would say, of course you are, because you're you. So with that being said, that wisdom from Professor Sanchez, let's get into it today. So we have our little Vermont Law School son here, nice and green for you all. So overview of where we're going, a roadmap. We're going to look at some current events, looking at some legislation, how to make change, some influential leaders, learning outcomes for this week, videos to watch, some reading excerpts that I thought were interesting from this week, paying the land, this notion of it, the concept and power of music, and how we are all connected at the end here. So we've got a lot going. Let's get into it, people. Let's have some fun. So the first one right here as well, too, is talking about how the Pope uh, recently visited Canada, issued an apology as well. Um, he has not issued an apology to anywhere in the United States where the Indian residential schools are based off of, where that kill the Indian to save the man that was based at Carlisle Indian School initially. But then there was, it says here, over 400 Indian boarding schools. I've seen the estimates even high. Um, that's some of the minimums served as a model for those residential schools. So um, a step in the right direction. However, uh, there still needs to be more. So for instance, we talk a little bit about this thing called the Doctrine of Discovery, which was a palpable bull back from 1493. And it seems like, wow, that's so long ago, that's so outdated. Well, you know, you'd think so. However, this is from a 2005 Supreme Court ruling where Ruth Bader Ginsburg recognizes how under the Doctrine of Discovery, fee tumbled to the lands occupied by Indians when the colonists arrives became vested in this sovereign, the first the, the discovering European nation and later the original states in the United States. So what the palpable bull means is that any lands inhabited by non-Christian peoples would be considered terra nullis or be uh, land belonging to no one, able to be quote unquote discovered. This doctrine of discovery was cited in a Supreme Court ruling again, 2005, so not that long ago, uh, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg used it to, to justify the taking of lands from members of the Oneida Nation of New York. So as we move along here as well to some more current events in the House resolutions, this one's put forth through the House of Representatives, the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding Schools Policy Act. Uh, it was uh, first, first uh, representatives, da uh, Sharice Davids out in Kansas, put that forth. It first introduced that on September 30th, 2021. Um, so as you, as you can view these online as well too at the House of Representatives, and it tells you where it is relative to becoming a law. So it's still just introduced yet. As there was a there was a truth and healing uh, a truth and reconciliation commission in Canada, so we're kind of somewhat basing ours off of that, but we still have a long ways to go. As you can see, it's not even passed into law yet, so it has to get two thirds majority through uh, House representatives and two thirds representatives two thirds approval through the Senate. But this you can see is the the proposed bill in the House of Representatives HR five four four five four four four. And it's talking about to enact the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies in the United States and for other purposes. You can read more about the bill. It goes more in the detail about it. 
This is on the Senate side. So with our 100 senators there, it's Senate um, S2907, also the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding Schools Policy Act, still just introduced yet. And this is uh, for the same purpose, uh, to establish a Truth and Healing Commission on Indian school policies in the United States and for other purposes. You can look at more of the detail in-depth idea if you look at the bills specifically. But I just wanted to give you an idea. So this is one of the books that one of my cousins wrote. So I talked about my great-grandfather being forced to attend Carlisle Indian Boarding School. I'll talk about that more in a second. But here is a picture. She, she, wrote, she wrote this book and had a, one of her colleagues illustrate it for her as well, too. This is a picture as well, too, on the right. And it's looking at these children who are hiding under the bed in the corner of the room, being ever so careful to not make a sound while the baby slept in a cradle board lying on top of the bed. Electa had warned them that being found could have the devastating result of being taken away and perhaps never coming back to the family home. They had practiced this little, quote, hiding exercise many times, and they became quite good at it. So this notion is that the idea that when these um, boarding school agents, these Indian, these federal Indian agents from Bureau of Indian Affairs, they would come by and be hired to go to, to, to go around the homes of native children and of native homes and take away the children. If the parents resisted, they would arrest the parents and take the children anyways. So this is they had a, a practice routine to try to be to stay hidden. Um, and that was just this just to show you the fear of what that was like in terms of this was not a voluntary thing. This was not a positive thing. This was people being forced and taken a very scary thing. Uh, some direct documents here. So I talk about my great grandfather in 2014, Carlisle Indian School made their, their student files all public record. So you can look up, for instance, Anderson William Cornelius, the student file at Carlisle Indian School. Amongst other things, you'll find some of these letters, which happened when he ran away twice. The first time here, it says, Mr. Henderson, from a note from 1912, Anderson Cornelius is a deserter from the country and should be disciplined accordingly. So that's talking about there from the superintendent of the school. This is the second time he ran away is on the right here, so, um, running to his, mo his mom, which is my great, great grandmother. I regret to advise you that your son Anderson deserted from his outing here on July 4th and that we have not yet succeeded in locating him. Hoping that you will let me hear if you arise at your home or if you learn where he is, I remain. And, you know, he did, he ended up not being caught and uh, which was great. And I'm still here today. And my family is because of that, as there was over 180 uh, tombstones at Carlisle Indian Boarding School and another 13 tombstones for unknown children, children's remains who are unable to be identified. So it's important. It's really devastating. It's really triggering. It's really awful to talk about these things, but we need to acknowledge, educate, and honor these human beings who went through it, who endured it, who did not get to come home, whose families still don't have answers to this day, who are still have yet to be able to grieve or mourn or have the emotional release of letting that person go or even knowing what happened to that person. A lot of people still don't have answers. So I consider myself lucky that my good grandpa ran away from school twice, but what he endured is um, devastating and it'll just make your blood curl. Some of the stories that um, I've, I've heard in terms of what he had to endure. So this being said, if you're passionate about this, if you hear this, say, you know what, we should have change. You know what, I would encourage you to find, if you know who your house representative representative is, then definitely reach out to them. You can email them, you can call their office, you can let them know that you're attending Vermont Law School, that you're very interested in this in this specific bills. You can you can address them by name, it's talking about the HR 544, if you're talking about your, to your house of rep, your house of representative, or if you're talking to um, your senator, then it's S2, um, S2907. But definitely, you can be the change you want to see in the world. We are the leaders we've been waiting for in the world, the words of Grace Lee Boggs. So I definitely encourage you, if you're, if you're curious about those bills, if you are passionate about that, I think with great power comes great responsibility, as Uncle Ben said in spider Ban. And when I told my great uncle Ben that before he passed away, he thought that was pretty cool as well, too. So with that notion, you all have, you are educated, you all have awareness. I think there's responsibility with awareness. So I would encourage you with your power, with your knowledge is to try to create change right now, not to wait, but today in this moment, when you're, when you're, when this is hitting your heart, say you are, you are put here with a purpose to create change. So I really do believe that. And I believe in you, you can do it. We can do it together. So when we talk about change, it can feel like it's overwhelming at times. I learned during my PhD, this is a notion put forth by Ken Wilbur. It's called this integral theory. You can look at the A qual is the name of this chart right here. Um, and it's, it's this notion that change can happen. It happens on this individual level of how we perceive things. And then it go, that will change eventually the culture of how humans happen. Let me walk you through this process as least as confusing as possible I can. 
And um, I do not pretend to be the subject matter expert on this. I know a little bit about it, but I would definitely defer to Ken Wilber and his readings and, and videos if you have more conversations on it. But let's start here. So if you want to make a change, one of the people who explained it to me was saying, all right, so you're passionate about trying to take care of Mother Earth and water. So I, had, I attended the protest at Standing Rock in 2017. It happened in 2016, 2017. I was there in 2017 just for a day. So if you want to change how people think about water, you need to change about it on their individual level of how do they, how do they connect with it? So this is what we call in the first quadrant is I, and then goes to it, it's, and we, but let's start with the I also known as the subjective. This is your own, in your own mind, it's your thoughts, em emotions, memories, states of mind, perceptions, and immediate sensations. So that's going to be the I that anytime that you're, that you're thinking about things, then that goes into the it and the it are your actions, like showing up in the physical. And this is the objective. This is your material body, including the brain, anything you can see or touch or observe scientifically in time and space. So this is going to show up a lot of oftentimes through your individual actions, maybe how you vote, maybe how you talk to people, how you, how you interact with people, but it's, it's those physical actions, which then go into the it's, which is the inter-objective, which is that bottom right quadrant. And that talks about the systems, network, technology, government, and the natural environment. So this is talking about, um, we're talking about, I've heard this explained as what are the laws, what are the ordinances, what is the legislation, what are some of those structures in place, what is that government, those networks, what are some of those systems we have in place, and those, gonna, those are going to be in turn affected by how people think about things, how they interact with things, and then that's going to turn into the rules, which then turns into the we, which is the intersubjective in the bottom left quadrant, and that recognizes what are the shared values, meanings, language, relationships, and cultural background. The way I was described to it, what is the culture of the group now? So you've gone from the I being the thought, the it being the action, the it's being the rules or the laws, and the we being the culture. So if you want to affect, in this example, of how people think about water, if in changing that on a cultural level, when we see water as a relative, as a sacred object, you got to change how people think about that on an individual level and relate to it. And that's where actual change can happen. So I do think that you can make change as well through laws. You see examples of this through the Civil Rights Act of 1964 back in the day when it wasn't perfect by any means, but it, try, it was trying to get ahead of different, it was trying to um, change people's disposition in certain areas. We're uh, trying to lead people to, um, to more justice. And obviously we still have a long ways to go for people of color and for, for, um, for low socioeconomic status and different things in our country. We have a long way to go. And people like yourselves, like ourselves, we're in it to win it. We wanna make, we wanna make it better. We want to do our best. So with that being said, how do you make change? Think about that on that on that level. So this is one called a qual from Ken Wilber. So as we go from the I, the it, the it's the we. I also want to talk about, as you saw in the videos last week, really appreciate all of your responses as you talked about the Haudenosaunee influence on the United States. A lot of you, like myself growing up, had never heard about that in schools. We're baffled saying, are you kidding me? No way. I remember my grandma, I told you, Eleanor Bailey, an elder in our tribe, she would tell me growing up, well, you know, TJ, the Haudenosaunee actually influenced United States system of governance. And I, being ignorant, would say, Grandma, well, you know, if that's true, I probably would have learned about that in school. But having grown up uh, in school in California from the age of nine to 18 in their public schools, you know, I never learned about that. Um, in fact, when I tried to bring it up in different schools, even during my PhD program at University of San Diego, I had different, um, I had different classmates, colleagues, instructors uh, question and being very highly critical and skeptical of the fact that the Haudenosaunee influenced the United States com uh, Constitution, when in fact they did. This here is the, the House Concurrent Resolution 331 from 1988, and this is recognizing whereas the Confederation of the Original 13 Colonies into one republic was influenced by the political system developed by the Iroquois Confederacy, also known as the Haudenosaunee, as we call ourselves, the people of the Longhouse, as were many of the democratic principles which were incorporated into the Constitution itself. So that's just a segment of it. It goes on to tell more as well, too, but this is looking for their own, their own Congress of the United States, having by the, 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 the Senate, by their, by their own omission, by their own words, saying that this, yes, indeed, in 1988, that looking back for the formation of the country. So for what other reason, what other purpose would, would, the, would the Senate have to do this if, this, if, if it was not the truth? And that's just one example. Let me give another one as well, too. It's interesting. What if I tell you this, if you grew up in the state of New York, then you would have... Um, then you would have already heard about this because in the state of New York, it is taught in schools that the Haudenosaunee, which is where the Haudenosaunee originally, also as the Iroquois, uh, originally in upstate New York, also into parts of Canada as well too, in the different areas, but really into what we know today, uh, into North Country around there as well too, um, up in upstate New York, not too far from y'all in Vermont. I've driven through 
um, going through that area. I go to upstate New York a lot for, for work and private consulting for restorative justice and different things. But here's an example of when I was there at Salmon River High School, which is the largest populated Native American public school in the nation. 67% uh, Native American, predominantly Mohawk students, which are one of the six nations that comprise the Haudenosaunee, like myself being Oneida, um, I'm one of those six as well too. But here's an example. So for, I'll just gonna read, read this little infographic here. The state of New York has middle school students recreate building a longhouse, a traditional Haudenosaunee living structure. This is in stark contrast to the state of California having students build missions built by indigenous enslaved people and are the mass burial sites of indigenous murdered people. As I said before, Haudenosaunee translates to people of the longhouse. And this, I, I wrote this as well too. And it says, someday I would love to see longhouses being made by students all over the United States in honoring the tribal confederacy from which the United States government is based off of. The Haudenosaunee are one of the longest running, if not the longest running democracy in the world. So since 1142 AD. So pretty wild that the state of New York teaches that as well too. And it's like, well, why do we not teach about this in all the other states as well too? We recognize that our, that our country today is not only taken from the lands of indigenous peoples, but our form of governance is also taken from indigenous peoples as well too. And I think it's important for people to acknowledge, educate and honor that. So here's a picture of me with Chief Oren Lyons, who's a faith keeper of the Onondaga Nation. We've had a chance to, to work together a number of times and speak together. One of my big colleagues and mentors and uh, friends. I remember I almost went to his 90th birthday party out here. It was gonna be 90s theme. And it was right before, um, that was like right at the time when um, COVID-19 hit in March of 2020. So I ended up not being able to go to that party, which would have been awesome. But <laughs> I've been to his house. He's given me a tour of Longhouse up in Onondaga, which is the it's that they're the fire keepers. It's the capital of the Haudenosaunee. It's where they still hold their, those council meetings to this day. And that form, as you all learned in the videos before, with those 50 different uh, leaders, those sachems, also known as chiefs, who's are, who are appointed by the clan mothers, but they still meet to this day and they'll make decisions and, and, and make, in, uh, make decisions in consensus. So here's a, another picture of me and Chief Oren Lyons. Always a pleasure being with, with Oren. Also played goalie at Syracuse University on the cross for a number of years. Phenomenal goalie. Um, well, you played in college, uh, undefeated season with Jim Brown as well, too, for any sports fans out there. Also looking at people who are being that leaders being the change that they want to see in the, the world as well, too. Those native le leaders stepping into positions of governments and trying to make a change as well, too. Uh, for instance, the first California Indian to be elected into the California State Assembly, that'd be Jordan Ramos of the Serrano and Cahuilla tribe, seen on our left. Also, the fir first female principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, that's Wilma Mankiller, lived from 1945 to 2010. And that picture of her on the right there. Going to see some more leaders as well too. We're going from left to right, starting at the top row, then going to the bottom. But up in the top left, Win Winona LaDuke, who's still with us as well too. Then you see there, uh, Russell Means right there in the top middle. Then on the right is Dennis Banks, some of the leaders of the American Indian Movement, which is still an ongoing organization to this day. The bottom left there, there you see Von Deloria, who's uh, just really an influential leader, a, an incredibly influential mind, who has very much influenced academia and with his mind in his words and what he's written. Then you also see there Sachi and Littlefeather, who is an activist at that uh, picture during the 1970s when she went on behalf of Marlon Brando to decline, um, um, to decline the Oscar uh, due to the poor treatment of Native American people in film and media. And she's just been an activist for all her life. There next to her on the bottom, uh, second from the bottom right there, you see um, this is Leonard Peltier. Leonard Peltier has been a political prisoner since 1977 for 45 years for a, a crime, which we know now from the Freedom of Information Act that he did not commit, that the bullets do not match the gun, that it was not him who's doing that, who was in there, who uh, committed the crime. So there's different documentaries on that. There's books on that. But that's that's Leonard Peltier as well, too. So I really think it'd be powerful restorative justice if Leonard Peltier was to be able to be set free. And then in the bottom right there, you have Richard Oakes. And Richard Oakes was one of the leaders of the Alcatraz occupation from 1969 to 1971 as well too. So there's some different different leaders who are using the voice to try to create that restorative cycle to, to create try to create that harmony and balance of for indigenous peoples as well too. So for this week, some of your learning outcomes were to be to, to learn about the Navajo legal system, which we've talked about already for a couple of weeks, but just to to look about that a little bit more here in the readings, how that Navajo customary law using the example of the peacemaker court, but a lot of you have already pointed out in the readings as well too, but really just incorporating the sacred with those, uh, with their, the circle process as well too, incorporating their traditions into their court system, having the court be in a circle format, 
this notion that to act as if you have no relatives is one of the biggest insults that you could put towards somebody. So that notion of community, of family, of interrelatedness, and that is essential as part of their, of their justice system and their presence of community as well too. Uh, which is also that point number two, describes the ways in which Navajo customary laws protect Dene, Dene culture. Dene translates to the people, and that's the Dene word for, for, it's the Navajo word for Navajo. So Dene is what the people call themselves and translates to the people, which I always think is beautiful that many different indigenous people's words, when you translate them, for instance, the Haudenosaunee means the people of the longhouse. The Dene means the people. And there's other translations of, of the, the words of their tribe, oftentimes describing themselves as people or the people. Analyze the potential of the Ocheti Sakawan Oyati truth and reconciliation process in South Dakota. So we'll go over that with a slide here a little bit later. Some videos you all are going to watch on your own. And some of you have already had the chance to meet in person Chief Justice Robert Yazi. So I'm super jealous and I'm really looking forward to it. I really uh, cannot wait to meet Chief Justice Robert Yazi someday. I'll have to, um, I cannot wait for that day, but I'm grateful, grateful that you all, people who already had a chance to do that, that's amazing, that's incredible. So you all will have to tell us more in your reflections as well too for your week three responses so that everybody can, can check those out and learn from you. But you're gonna learn a little bit more from Chief Justice Robert Yazi talking about that Diné system of restorative justice. Then you're also just gonna watch a tra trailer here for this film, Tribal Justice. It's a, a phenomenal film if you get a chance to watch it. It's been a little bit harder to access in terms of streaming as it's no longer available on PBS or different things. If you get a chance to watch the whole thing, it's great. Even just the trailer just gives a, no a notion of this idea of just second chances of people being worthy of second chances of, be of, being, of being better than their worst mistakes, so to speak. Some examples from the readings here for this week and your book, Just Justice is Healing, which I love all the different segments and different uh, nuggets of wisdom in there. There's, there's so much information, there's so much um, truth within there as well, too. It's re really, really powerful. Here's one notion right here. Healing is about being aligned with natural spiritual law. That alignment can happen swiftly, but the healing process itself takes a long time. The major part of the unresolved suffering that needs to be healed actually belongs to the ancestors. By healing themselves, each generation heals their ancestors. So I've heard that said before. When you heal yourself, you heal your ancestors. And I've also heard talking with um, professional people in psychology and this notion that it's, it's important to have your boundaries of what you're able to take on, what you're able to process, but at the same time, we are all connected. So it's, it's also important to recognize that, yes, that, that the love of the life of those people lives on inside of your heart as well, too, that your, your relatives, their blood is inside of you as well, too. Their stories are inside of you and how important that is. If you, if, uh, if you, a living being with energy can, can heal and you can, um, you can change that. That can that can change the trajectory of our future, and, and you're making an impact in our past as well too. For many Indigenous people, this notion of a Gregorian calendar of time happening linear is kind of a foreign notion. It's really this notion of time being very circular. That things that we do, it's everything that we're doing. It's being now. It's it's being simultaneously influenced by seven generations behind us, while we're simultaneously simultaneously influencing seven generations ahead of us. So it's very much a connected flow. Uh, so it's that's this notion of by healing themselves, each generation heals their ancestors, which I thought was powerful. Another example here, what is the healing for an individual? And um, this individual says a healthy person has something to get up for in the morning. I thought that was a, a very beautiful articulation of that. A healthy person has something to get up for in the morning. As we're looking here at the Ocheti Sakawan Essential Understandings and Standards, this is uh, this idea, I was reading it here from Lakota scholar, Dr. Craig Howe in 2010 says, the hope is that citizens who are well educated about the Ocheti Sakawan history and culture will be more likely to make better decisions in the arena of Indian issues and to get along better with one another. So this idea by better understanding our roots, our history, our heritage, where we come from, where what, how we are meant and designed to relate to, another, to one another, to connect with one another, to speak with one another, if we can, if we can remember, if we can go back to that, that will help us also in our in restoring ourselves and our community. So some of the, those points at a glance here, looking at looking at those notions of with lands and environment, with identity and resiliency, with culture and language, with kinship and harmony, oral tradition and story, sovereignty and treaties, way of life and development. And that last one says the essential philosophy of the Ocheti Sakawan. Uh, Wicho way of life is based on the values of the Ocheti Sakawan, which have already, which have created resiliency of the Oyate people. Tribal communities have put considerable effort into education, economic development, 
trouble universities and colleges, wellness centers, cultural traditions, and language revitalization. That in the words of Nelson Mandela, if you wanna truly change the world, you need to change education. And I really do believe that education is one of the most powerful tools of empowerment. So I think that's true for tribal peoples, for all peoples, when you're able to know, when you, uh, when you, if you do not have, if you don't know your history, you don't know yourself. And so it's important, it's important to have that history. You, you have your, if you know your history, then you know yourself. So I think that's very important as well too. So some of the examples of the Ocheti Sakawan, uh, how they're going about restorative justice in their community is through education and, and um, educating their community so then they can get along better with one another. And this is from the Ocheti Sakawan OYT Truth and Reconciliation Process in South Dakota from 2010. As we move along here, now we're going to talk about our relation to our relatives of the water and of plants and of Mother Earth here. So stick with me here as we talk about these words from the elder of the Omaha tribe, who is Rene Sansusi. Sorry if I mispronounce your, your name, Rene. But Rene, an educator and activist, says, when you are approaching water, you make that petition to water and you make that tobacco offering because water is older than we are. That's our elder. Another example here is a book here by Joe Sacco. And the book is called Paying the Land. And it's a really powerful book as well, too, where it interviews some people, some First Nations people who are in modern day Canada. And they talk about here the Dene. It's D-E-N-E. -E, not to be confused with Dene down what are modern day Arizona, New Mexico, also known as Navajo. But for the Dene people up in the First Nations, they have this notion, one of these elders is saying that you need to pay the land. So the same way that you would pay the land that you would pay respect to a relative, where if you were to bring it water, if you were bring it tea, if you bring it tobacco, it's really important that you go out and pay the land the same way. So for this week, it's really important. I'm really grateful for each and every one of you as you're taking place in this spiritual experience as this class is very experiential. This idea of going out for at least making it a mindful, intentional idea of going out for at least five to seven minutes, going out and spending time with mother earth, going out and spending time, whether it's with, if you have access to plants or water or grass, whatever you can, but connecting with mother earth, letting know your gratitude, just really paying respect the same way that you would pay respect to a relative, to an auntie, to a grandma, to a, um, someone that you love very much, to a friend. So I just want you to think about that time. And in the group me, you're going to let us know. You can either take a picture, you can draw something, you can paint something, whatever your artistic expression is to to let us know about that. But you can also use some words. What were some things that came up to you during that meditation, during that time of reflection, that moment of mindfulness with nature? So that's that's your homework, people. You're, here, you're in law school. You need to go out there and spend some time with nature. So I mean it. I want you to all do it. I'm really serious about it. <laughs> and I look forward to hearing what y'all learned from it as well, too. Also, music is a powerful tool. I've heard it said that music is medicine, and I firmly believe that. I talked to you all how when we start talking circles, oftentimes how I was taught we were you're start it with either a prayer or a song. And oftentimes it's sung by an elder female. So I have some songs as well, some songs as well for you as well. And I'll, if you look in this YouTube uh, description, you can see a link for the Spotify playlist as well to this native playlist I've curated and put together for you all. And there's some different songs here as well too. We've listened to Fawnwood a little bit, but there's a number of different songs. Definitely encourage you all. So you can kind of go through the list and check them out. Some other artists I'd want you all to check out as well too is this band called The Hallucination, and they're formerly called A Tribe Called Red, a play on words from A Tribe Called Quest, and then also a play on words from this idea of Native American people just having being referred to as red. An example of such, my grandma on her birth certificate, under ethnicity, it just says red. So that's how the government displayed people. So it's kind of a reclaiming those words and taking it back. Now seen as The Hallucination, which are words from leader John Trudell and taking one of his poet, um, one of his poems and putting it into this, into their name of their, of their band. So the hallucination, this is me in Costa Mesa with Tim Hill. He's a member of the Mohawk Nation, and which is part of the Haudenosaunee. This is us together, all smiles, having a good time. And then this is also Bear Witness, who's of the Cayuga Nation, which is another nation that makes up the Haudenosaunee. As we go again, it's the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and later the Tuscarora. But other, the other, the second DJ in the hallucination here. So they use a powerful idea. They have this notion of land back, and they'll they do this notion of using music as a form of activism and different ways of subversion there in in 2014 they played at this music festival called Coachella and they got into some controversy by a lot of different news organizations because they were wearing these shirts that said Caucasians at the time they were protesting a lot of the Native American sports teams which as we've seen for rightful reason as we've seen in I talked about that Washington R skins having changed their name we talked about 
haven't talked about it, but the Cleveland, formerly Cleveland Indians, now be the Cleveland Guardians, grateful for it. But they're, the idea that they oftentimes will bring in their activism into their music as well too. So that's just an example of the hallucination doing such. And it was so interesting because in the media, everyone was saying, wow, this band is racist. They're wearing these shirts that says Caucasians. And, they're saying, and that's the whole point saying, well, how does it feel of being an ethnicity and being put forth as a mascot? Say so that doesn't feel good. That we are we are not a mascot. We are people. We are human beings. So then it goes along here um, as we put our final words here of our time together during this talking circle for week three, using the words of Dr. Donald Warren, who is who is of Ogala Lakota ancestry, and whose um, Lakota name means Pejuta Wakasa, which means medicine man. And Dr. Donald Warren says. Let us remember, we all drink from the same stream of consciousness. We are all connected by that same stream of consciousness. We are all related. What we do to each other, we do to ourselves. Act kindly toward my people, for indeed, my people are your people. So it's been a pleasure to be with each and every one of you today. I, I love y'all. Gunalunkwa means I love you. If you have any questions, please stop by office hours. You have the link. And that is from Pacific time, 3 to 4 p.m. So if you're out on the East Coast, that's 6 to 7 p.m. And y'all have been amazing. Don't forget that you're wonderful. I know it's tough out there. Keep taking care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Just an invitation, not an obligation. But if you want it, only if you want it, hit the deepest breath of love you've had all day. Breathe in like you love yourself. Think like you love yourself. Move like you love yourself. Give me a deep breath of love here. And exhale some love you are a human being who is love you are love you are worthy of love our universe is made of love and it's the most abundant thing in the universe yawanko gunalunkwa nuiwa means thank you i love you until next time on oneida yawanko thanks everybody take care